Good afternoon. Thank you, Walter. Hi, I'm Brian Green, professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University, co-founder of the World Science Festival. And there has deservedly been a lot of discussion at the Ideas Festival about AI. And so I thought I would just quickly share my own recent experience because I wanted to begin here on a, on a lighter note, so I did what most of us would do in the post-November 2022 world would. I consulted with ChatGPT. I asked Chat to write me a joke. Of course, a physics joke, and because I'd be delivering it, I asked Chat to write it in the style of Brian Greene. Here's what Chat came up with. Why did the photon go to the doctor? Answer, because it was feeling lightheaded. Not bad, not great. Hold your applause on that. So, so I asked Chad, I, I said, can't you come up with something more clever, something more creative? And Chad replied, of course I can come up with something more creative and clever, but you asked me to write in the style of Brian Greene. <laughs> now, in that little joke was the word photon, right? And the photon is a notion that achieves its most refined articulation in a description of the universe called quantum mechanics. And we are now in the 100th anniversary year, or really decade, of the discovery of quantum mechanics, and it's still a hugely active field. The 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three researchers in the arena of quantum mechanics. So what I'd like to do in the brief time that we have here this afternoon is just take us on a tour of where we are, what the state of the art is in our understanding of quantum mechanics. Now, what is quantum mechanics? The best way to answer that question is by comparison to the earlier description of the universe called classical mechanics. And briefly put, in the 1700s and the 1800s, we were able to discern patterns in the motion of objects, and we were able to articulate those patterns in the rigorous language of mathematics. And with the language of mathematics, we could make predictions for how things move. For instance, how a ball would bounce, or how a wheel would spin and travel, or how a object going through space would follow a particular trajectory. But here's the thing, as we pushed our understanding beyond the macro world into the micro world, the world of photons and electrons, we found that the earlier ideas gave wrong predictions, and we were forced through a series of experiments and ideas to change our paradigm from predicting what will happen to giving a probabilistic prediction of what may happen. And if you don't remember anything else from the remarks I'm giving here today beyond quantum mechanics being a theory that is based on a probabilistic framework, you will have really gotten the essence of the transition into the quantum world. Now, let me just try to give you a feel for why science was forced to this probabilistic description. And there's a simple little experiment that captures the heart of the reasoning. It's called the double slit experiment. And it goes like this. So imagine that we have a little gun that's firing pellets, BBs at a barrier with two openings, two slits. You would expect that those BBs that go through the left opening will land in a band on the left, and those that go through the right opening will land on a band on the right side. And indeed, if you did this experiment, this is exactly what you would find. Good. Now let's make one change. Dial down the size of the pellets, the BBs. Make them smaller and smaller. Make them as small as a photon or an electron. Now, our intuition would tell us that the size of the projectile shouldn't matter, and so you would expect exactly the same kind of pattern. 
Those that go through the opening on the left land in a band on the left side. Those that go through the right opening will land on a band on the right. But if you do this experiment, this is not the pattern you find. Instead, if you do this experiment with photons or electrons, you find a pattern that looks like this. Now, notice it's not random, but it's not the pattern we expect based on our everyday experience. As, say, the electrons go through, the best we can say is that a fraction of a time they land on the far left, and a fraction of the time on the band next to that, and so forth. Now, these are particles that are being fired in exactly the same way, and yet they land in a variety of distinct positions. So the best we can do is describe the motion in terms of the probability of the electron landing in one location or another. And that's what gives rise to this probabilistic description. Now, Albert Einstein, right, the great master of understanding the universe, he resisted this idea of probabilities in a metaphorical, poetic language where he said he could not believe that God plays dice with the universe. Now, Niels Bohr, in a retort that has less fame, responded by saying, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> and indeed, this probabilistic predictions are ones that we hold dear in our understanding of physics. But you might ask yourself, why did Einstein so resist this probabilistic approach to the world? Because after all, we hear probabilities all the time, weather reports, casinos, flipping a coin. But those probabilities are fundamentally different from the probabilities of quantum mechanics because those probabilities emerge because of a lack of detail, a lack of full understanding, right? If you knew everything about every molecule in the atmosphere, its position, where it's been, where it's going, you would be able to determine whether or not it is going to rain. You wouldn't need probabilistic forecasts. But because we don't have access to all of that information, we have to resort to this idea of likelihoods or probabilities. The probabilities of quantum mechanics are different. They are foundational probabilities, not because of a lack of complete information. It's because at rock bottom, according to these ideas, the world is governed by a game of chance. Second reason why Einstein resisted this idea, it went against the grain of his understanding of how the world works, is because when we say a coin has a 50% chance of heads or tails, we know what that means. It's going to land either heads or tails, nothing in between. But in quantum mechanics, when we say an electron has a 50% chance of being here or there, before we actually look, according to the most conventional interpretation of the theory, the electron is hovering in a mixture of being at those two locations. That is so weird that Einstein resisted it. Now, you might say, if you were talking to Albert Einstein, say, look, you know, we don't experience electrons in everyday life, so just imagine that that's how things behave way down there, and that somehow when you get up to the big world, we don't encounter this sort of hazy, fuzzy reality that holds in the micro world. And in a famous thought experiment that everybody has heard of, Aaron Schrodinger showed that that notion, that somehow probabilities could be sequestered in the micro world and not infect the macro world, he showed that could not be true. How do you do that? Well, you imagine they have a cat in a box. If the electron's on the left-hand side, the cat lives. But if the electron's on the right, some poison is released and the cat dies. Now he says, what if that electron is in a fuzzy mixture, half on the left and half on the right? Would that mean the cat is in a fuzzy mixture of being alive and dead? Now that is such a weird idea 
a cat being a mixture of being alive and dead, that this gives some feel for why Einstein resisted this. So why would we physicists accept quantum mechanics? The answer is, it's not just pictures. We have mathematics. The mathematics makes predictions. The predictions are borne out by experiment. Now, every time that I've been on this very stage in the past and I turned to mathematics, I never did it alone. I always did it with two particular, very special helpers. Alkin and Sophia, come up here one second. So here on this T-shirt is the standard model of particle physics. Sophia, what, what is that symbol meant to describe? A Higgs field. A Higgs field, yes. And this term over here, what is that, man? A Higgs potential. A Higgs potential. Thank you very much. We're back by command, performance. Can I have my two helpers, Alec and Sophia? What equation do we have right here? Einstein field equation. What do we have over here? Schwarzschild solution. Right. And now for the, I suspect, the final time that I will ever be able to convince them to do this. Alec and Sophia. All right, so Sophia, tell me what you have on your shirt right there. Schrodinger's equation for the evolution of the quantum wave function. Perfect. Alec, what's on your shirt here? This is Feynman's sum over history's approach, revealing how a weighted sum of all possible trajectories yields the quantum probability. Thank you both very much. Now the point is, using that mathematics, we can make very detailed predictions for things like the properties of particles. So electrons have a property known as the electron magnetic moment. Experiment, you don't need to know exactly what that means, it's like a little tiny magnet. When you measure that magnetic property, this is the number you get. When you use that mathematics to calculate that number, here's what you get breathtaking agreement between theory and observation. And beyond that, once you can describe the micro world with that kind of precision, you can control it, you can manipulate it, giving rise ultimately to the integrated circuit, which is why we have all of the powerful technological devices that we walk around with in everyday life. In fact, 35% of the gross national product relies in this way on quantum mechanics. And actually, I went back to check that 35% just to have the source. You know, I went to, you know, NPR, to the New York Times, and unfortunately, I'm the source of the 35%. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I've never done the calculation, so it's a totally made up number, but you get the idea. <laughs> You get the idea that a great deal of what we produce relies upon quantum physics. But Einstein still, even with the evidence that was available in his time, could not accept that this was the full story. And in 1935, he writes a paper trying to expose a flaw in quantum mechanics. And that flaw has to do with something called quantum entanglement. Let me just quickly describe for you what Einstein found in the mathematics of quantum mechanics. And I'll describe it in a little example. Every particle in the universe, it turns out, it spins at one particular rate, either in one direction or the other. And we have some language that we use. If it's spinning in this way, we wrap our fingers around and we say that it is spinning up. If it's spinning the opposite, we say it's spinning down. Okay, now, just as an electron can be partially here and partially there, a particle can be partially spinning up and partially spinning down, and it only acquires a definite spin when we measure it. So here it's up and down, measure it, we find it to be down. Now that's weird that reality can exist in this fuzzy haze of multiple possibilities that only resolves itself 
upon measurement, but I want you to accept this because it's true and I want to go much further. Here is what Einstein found. He said, look, you could have two particles in this fuzzy mixture of up and down, and you could then separate those particles as widely as you would like. You can then go over to, say, the particle on the left and measure it, three, two, one, measure, causing it to snap out of the haze, and exactly that moment the other particle also snaps out of the haze, even though you have done nothing to it. Another version, imagine we have them in this fuzzy mixture. You go over this time to the particle on the right-hand side, three, two, one, you measure it, it snaps out of the haze, and the particle on the left also does. Einstein called this spooky. Spooky action at a distance. You do something here and affect something over there, and although I frame this in a laboratory setting, it can be anywhere in space, across the entire universe if you like. These entangled particles according to the math of quantum mechanics, you measure one, let's say I measure the one on the right-hand side, snaps out of the haze. Similarly, the particle on the left does as well. Einstein said nobody in their right mind could accept that this is how the world works. Decade after decade, scientists developed the mathematics further, developed the experimental techniques further, and showed that this is not a flaw of quantum mechanics, it's a feature of quantum mechanics. And indeed, the 2022 Nobel Prize was awarded to these three individuals for all the work that they did establishing that this spookiness, this quantum entanglement is real, is how the universe actually works. And moreover, especially the gentleman on the right-hand side, Anton Zeilinger, showed that you can do stuff with this. You can teleport objects, particles, from one location to another, right? So imagine that we have two entangled particles. One, say, is in New York, the other is in Paris. And imagine you want to teleport a third particle, the red particle, from New York to Paris. Here's how you can do it. You take that red particle and you bring it into an association. You let it meld in some very specific way with the entangled particle in New York. That imprints the key properties of the red particle on the particle in New York, and through entanglement, those properties are instantaneously imprinted on the particle in Paris. And then, through an appropriate measurement in New York, you can tell the person in Paris exactly what to do to pull out those properties, yielding an identical version of the red particle now in Paris. And in fact, the act of undertaking this quantum teleportation destroys the particles back in New York. So the only remaining version of the red particle is indeed the one in Paris. And this is real. This is not hypothetical. In fact, Anton Zeilinger not only is a very clever physicist, he knows the life that he likes to lead. He has his experiment for teleportation set up in the Canary Islands. La Palma, Tenerife, 90 miles apart, he routinely teleports particles between one location and another. Now the coda to this story, which of course is one that continues to be developed, is this. In 1935, Einstein wrote another paper having nothing to do with quantum mechanics having to do instead with the general theory of relativity, the theory of warps and curves in the fabric of space and time. And in this paper, which is with one of the colleagues in the entanglement paper, Nathan Rosen, they showed that there might be things called wormholes, right? This is a familiar idea from anybody who watches some science fiction. What is the idea? That if space can warp and curve, you can have shortcuts going from one location in space to another location through a kind of tunnel, a wormhole-like tunnel from one location to another. 
And in this particular imagery, anyone who's following the news and has noted that the feds have approved the first ever congestion pricing in New York City will recognize this would be a beautiful way to not enter midtown Manhattan and be subject to that particular toll. But putting that application to the side, Einstein had no idea that there might be any connection to this notion of entanglement. And what's happening now, right at the forefront of understanding, is this. Work that really finds its origins in string theory and other cutting-edge developments have shown that there is a deep connection between wormholes, which connect one location to another, with entanglement that connects a particle at one location to another. This is the work of Juan Maldacena, Lenny Suskind, and this may very well be the key to realizing the long-standing dream of Einstein's, of finding a unified theory which in the modern language would meld together our understanding of the laws of the small quantum mechanics with our understanding of the laws of the large, the general theory of relativity. So I certainly look forward to future years coming back and describing where this goes, but I want to finish with one mystery, a profound mystery that no quantum physicist, no physicist at all has given us any insight into which is this. How could it be? I mean, seriously, think about it. How could it be that Tom Wamsgans <laughs> could possibly ascend to the throne of Waystar Rocco? To answer that mystery, I will now cede the stage to the next discussion, Katie Kirk and Brian Cox. Thank you very much.